This is a history of Blackwell. The first African inhabitants of the New World arrived in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. What's important about this inaugural group of African Americans is that for the next 60 plus years, they lived a life of parity with other non-Black immigrants. They married, voted, owned land, testified in court, and intermingled with whites as equals. But it's important to look at this time period through an economic lens as well. America at that time was like a startup. Europeans with money sent resources and representatives to invest capital on the speculation that there were growth opportunities to be had here. If you didn't have money, you could invest your labor. You pledged your labor to a planter or importer who sponsored you for a number of years, and once you'd worked off that debt, you were free to pursue your own economic opportunities. And decades after the first arrivals, black settlers did that right alongside whites. Anthony Johnson came to America in 1621. He worked off his indentured contract and then began acquiring property. 30 years later, he had acquired 250 acres in Northampton County, Virginia, through what was called a headright system that awarded 50 acres of land for every individual imported to the colony. In 1652, John Johnson imported 11 people, including both black and white indentured servants, and accumulated 550 acres of land. The servants were released once their contracts were up and the process continued. The available records suggest that in this window of time between 1620 and the end of that century, thousands of black settlers came to the New World through families and whole communities. Not all amassed huge land holdings, but their personal and economic pursuits were no more or less constrained than their white counterparts. So what changed? Well, the American startup gained traction. Worldwide demand for labor-intensive exports like sugar and tobacco exploded. And indentured servant contracts gave capitalists a taste of how much profit could be made when you don't have to pay for labor. From that point on, the choice of whom to enslave was made based on what was most efficient. The choices were white immigrants from Europe and their American-born children, black immigrants from Africa and their American-born children, and Native Americans. White servants who ran away could blend in. Native Americans had home-filled advantage. They knew where to run and not be found. Blacks had neither of those advantages. In fact, the racial construct of black and white didn't really exist prior to the advent of slavery. It was born out of necessity. Once slavery became the law, the law was no longer on the side of black Americans. They could no longer go to school or vote or own land or businesses. But remember, they were doing all those things for nearly a century before slavery became firmly entrenched in the U.S. That translates to at least three generations of wealth building. So pay close attention because this is the origin of the racial wealth gap and it lays out a pattern that we'll see repeated. For the first 80 to 90 years of this country's existence, black Americans built wealth and then had it taken, wiped out as if it never existed. Then for the next 246 years, they became wealth for white owners. So central to white wealth were black slaves that their images were printed on Confederate money. Slaves were intergenerational wealth passed down from father to son, six plus generations of black children growing up to become the accumulated wealth of white children with compounding value. The value of the person, the value of their labor, and the value of their ability to produce offspring that too would become enslaved. Then the North wins the Civil War, and slavery ends. Union General William Sherman and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton gathered a group of Black leaders together and asked them what the Black community needed to build a future in a post-slavery America. The answer was 
Give us land. We can take it from there. So they did. General Sherman issued a special order granting freed slaves 40 acres of land, and Congress established the Freedmen's Bureau to oversee the land grant and the provision of other reparative resources, including job training, education, and the creation of the Freedmen's Savings and Trust Bank. President Lincoln signed all of these provisions into law in March of 1865. In April, he was assassinated. The first order of business for his successor, Andrew Johnson, was to rescind all but one of these provisions. Within a single year, all of the land granted to freed slaves had been confiscated by law or through violence. Job training, education programs, eliminated. The one program he didn't touch was the Freedmen's Bank. Branches were expanded throughout the South, and Blacks were encouraged not to pursue a handout of land, but rather to save their money wisely so they could buy it. And they did. Within 10 years, Black households deposited more than $75 million in the Freedmen's Savings Bank. That would be roughly $1.5 billion in today's money. But this bank that was created for Black Americans and heavily marketed to Black Americans was not controlled by Black Americans. White trustees who were appointed to oversee the funds allowed it to be looted. It shut down in 1874, wiping out more than half of the Black wealth that had been accumulated. And yet, Black people didn't give up on banking. The first black bank was chartered in Richmond, Virginia, less than 10 years later by Reverend William Washington Brown. Later, as the Great Migration brought African Americans north, discrimination came with them. Shut out from white banks, black banks and credit unions opened in record numbers. One of the most notable black bankers of the 1920s was Jesse Binga. First building his wealth in Chicago through real estate, when his customers couldn't obtain bank loans to purchase his properties, he purchased a failed white bank in 1907 and turned it into the Binga State Bank. By 1924, Binga's bank had over $1 million in deposits. But despite being better capitalized than many of his white bank peers and more importantly being a full dues-paying member of the Chicago Clearinghouse that existed to rescue member banks when they needed emergency funding, when the Great Depression hit, Binga State Bank was the only member that was not granted funds to remain open. By 1930, Binga State Bank was closed by state auditors. Jesse Binga not only built black wealth for himself, he provided the means for others in the black community to do the same. Once again, when following the rules of wealth building began working for blacks, the rules changed. Wealth built, wealth erased, pattern repeated. Most Americans only learned of the destruction of black wealth that occurred during the Tulsa Massacre because of the HBO series, The Watchmen. But before Tulsa, there was Elaine, Arkansas in 1919 and Atlanta in 1906. Before that, there was Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. Before that, Colfax, Louisiana in 1873. And let's not forget Rosewood, Florida in 1923. And when black wasn't being taken by force or destroyed by violence, it was simply confiscated and turned into lakes and parks and Georgia and Alabama and California, Colorado, Oregon, Maryland, Connecticut, New Jersey. Even New York's Central Park is built on land confiscated from Black communities not once but twice. Communities erased along with their wealth. During World War II, White women and black women were permitted entry into the workforce to replace white men who went off to war. But when those white men returned, the focus shifted to helping them build wealth. The GI Bill subsidized home ownership and education costs for returning veterans, but black returning veterans were excluded by law. When the Fair Labor Standards Act was enacted in 1838, it protected every non-managerial occupation except domestic workers, and agricultural laborers. What were the 
were primary occupations for black people in 1938, domestic workers, and agricultural laborers. From the 1940s to the 1960s, redlining precluded black families from getting mortgages and isolated black neighborhoods so that even when a family was able to save enough to purchase a home, the value of the homes could not appreciate at the same rate as homes in white neighborhoods. And racial disparities in home valuations persists to this day. As recently as the 2008 economic crisis, black households lost 53% of their wealth compared to 23% for white households because black families were targeted for subprime mortgages even when they had excellent credit and should have been given conventional loans. So what this reveals is an uninterrupted pattern of black households following the maps that are supposed to lead to wealth accumulation, but somehow finding that those paths keep looping back to the starting line. So let's look at how these patterns translate into gaps. Education, employment, income, home ownership, financial assistance, health, retirement planning, inheritance. Each of these categories contribute to wealth, and there is a racial gap in every one of them. We know there's a gap in educational attainment, so we expect that to be a predictor of the gap in employment prospects and income growth, and in fact, it is. On average, someone with a college degree will out-earn someone without a degree by $1 million over their lifetime. And despite the popular opinion that college degrees don't matter anymore, the data tells us that this hasn't changed. In each of the economic recessions we've experienced in the past 20 to 30 years, college degree holders were the last to lose their jobs and the first to rebound when the economy started to recover. But the black-white education gap is even more profound than that. Historically, household educational attainment is a strong predictor of economic mobility. Stated another way, higher education levels and parents positively impact the educational achievements of their children. And a 2021 study found this to be true for Black children as well, except when those children attended urban schools. So we already know that the educational achievement gap is linked to the income and employment gap, but this study now ties it to where we live and housing stability. Housing stability is tied to home ownership, and not surprisingly, there is a gap here too. 42% of black families owned their own home in 2019 compared to 73% of white families. Perhaps increasing income will fix the problem. Well, here's where it gets really interesting. When we look at the racial wealth gap in relation to income, not only does the gap exist at every income percentile grouping except the bottom 20%, as income grows, the wealth gap gets wider exponentially. What this shows is that the wealthiest white Americans are doing things very differently from black Americans when it comes to using their income to accumulate and accelerate wealth. And the cornerstone of that difference is intergenerational wealth. And that's because intergenerational wealth counters multi-generational poverty. And this is where the path to wealth really starts to diverge by race. Black households are more likely than white households to be supporting other family members. They are more likely to slip back into poverty after escaping than white families. And not surprisingly, and perhaps most strikingly, black households are more likely than white households to be the second or third generation in poverty. But our micro gaps for black households are economic levers in white households that lift familial peer groups so that they aren't having to support as many people. Three generations of poverty is an almost exclusively Black experience. Here's another way to visualize what's happening. One of the ways wealth is reflected is through our standard of living. Inherited wealth and the strategies we use to manage our assets serve as a wedge that supports that standard of living. Taxes, inflation, death, disability, retirement, are all downward pressures that this wedge serves to buffer against. This is true for Black families as well, but now add the need to support additional family members, and also add the fact that Black households 
are more likely to use retirement funds for emergencies or to start a business. And what you are left with are additional financial pressures that are pulling from the wedge in ways that isn't happening in white households, leaving nothing to stop the slide backwards. Black households are using what wealth they can accumulate differently from white households in ways that diminishes black wealth while white wealth grows. But the past doesn't have to dictate the future. Anyone can build wealth no matter who you are or where you come from. But there is an order to things. Wealth is what you have left after deducting your debt from your assets. That's the starting point. Wealth is not the absence of debt. In fact, credit can be a wealth accelerator if it's managed properly. The goal is to eliminate debt that doesn't contribute to generating income or wealth and to have income left over to invest in wealth building. That's called discretionary income, which gives you assets to plan with. Once you have assets, you need to build a firm foundation before you can start building wealth. Slipping back into poverty or using accumulated wealth happens when you focus on accumulating wealth without taking steps to protect those gains. It's fine to be interested in NFTs and cryptocurrency, but if you're using these vehicles as a strategy for generational wealth without having retirement savings, insurance, or a home that built equity, your priorities are out of order. It's like an inverted pyramid. It can make money, but it's not stable. You're not following a wealth plan, you're gambling. The process of building wealth has several moving parts. And the history of black wealth shows us all the ways those moving parts hardened over time into barriers. But the new threat to black wealth has changed. It's no longer about access, because there are now ways to access wealth that don't reveal whether you're black or not. The threat now is information. Where, how, and from whom you're getting it. So remember this phrase, money talks, wealth whispers. If you're just getting started, fix your credit if it needs repair, then create a cash flow management plan that frees discretionary income you can start putting towards a wealth plan. If you need basic financial literacy education, YouTube and Google are fine places to start because those are basic strategies that can be applied universally. But once you're ready to start building wealth, you need to develop a financial strategy that works for you, your family, and your long and short-term goals. And that is not a DIY project. Money talks, wealth whispers, it's not whispering on YouTube, in a blog post, or on a podcast. We have choices that those who came before us did not. The future of black wealth will be decided by what we do with them. 